Welcome back to The Graham Stephan Show. My name is Graham, and welcome to my show. And today we're going to be speaking with Aaron, who is a self-published author on Amazon, who is making as high as $50,000 a month. So we're going to be bringing him on. He's got a few questions, and he's going to be sharing a story about how he quit his job and now self-publishes books on Amazon. So with that said, enjoy. Make sure to destroy the like button, and uh, let's begin. So welcome to The Graham Stephan Show. What's going on? Uh, hey, everything's right over here. Uh, how are you doing? Good, good. So what's going on? My name is Aaron Oster. I am a uh, number one best-selling author on Amazon. I self-published over 15 books as of this Thursday. And um, yeah, I wanted to talk. I had some questions about investing, saving money, buying a house, general stuff like that. Cool. Really quick though, I think if you wouldn't mind telling us about your your Amazon business. That's incredible. So, how did you how did you uh, get in how did you get started doing that? Uh yeah, so basically uh the story is is that um in 2018 I decided I was going to write a book. Um I'd always wanted to write one and always kind of started then stopped and then started again. Finally I just sat down. It took me about 4 months. I wrote the book I put it out. It was absolutely horrible. I sold nothing, literally like 30 copies to friends and family. Hmm. That's how bad it was. I gave up, you know, just forget it. Never going to make it as a writer. How do authors even make money? Um, then again, I tried. I had this great idea in my head. I'm like, I got to write this down. So about three months later in November, I started writing my next book, um, you know, which would eventually go on to sort of launch my career and when i actually put the book out it was just a total shocker like i the way things work in amazon is that um it's very easy to get like a number one bestseller tag like that orange tag you'll see at the top of a product or something like that and a lot of people will disparage self-published authors and say no you're not a real author you're not a new york times bestseller you know, because to be a New York Times bestseller, you got to sell between five and 10,000 copies in the first week, and they have a whole bunch of other requirements. But even by those requirements, by the New York Times bestseller requirements, I am a New York Times bestseller. They just won't put me on the list because I'm self-published. Mm. Um, so basically what ended up happening was by the end of March, I published this book in February. By the end of March, I'd made more money in that month than I'd made the entire year at my old job. Um, it was uh, how much, so still I'm, kind of hard to believe. I'm curious. Now I want to, how much was the book? Um, so the book, I, I sold mostly the ebook. Um, mm -hmm. So I put it up originally for $2.99 for the pre-order. I raised it to $3.99 uh, for the launch. Now it's $4.99. I was raised my prices a bit more. But uh, to get the ebook, it was only $3.99. Amazon lets you keep 70% of the royalties. My overhead cost on the book was $1,700 uh, to get it professionally edited and get a good cover. All the marketing I did by myself on social media. Wow. That's incredible. And do you mind if I ask, how much, how much did it make that first week? Or I guess within oh, the, uh, the month, the right? The month, yeah, the first month, the book made $26,000. Wow. And how do people find it? How, how do people come uh, across that so book? The way that I really got it, first of all, it's, you know, Amazon's got an algorithm. So if you show them that you can sell copies, they'll start showing it to more people. Uh, the way I originally got it in front of an audience was that I went to uh, a few fantasy Facebook groups. And by leaving links, to their group in the back matter of your books, they'll let you promote your book for free on their group. And when you have that kind of a targeted audience, you get you know, a lot more interest um, than you would just throwing a general ad out there. Mm -hmm. uh, so I mean, all it cost me was a couple of links in the back of my book, and uh, that's kind of what launched the entire thing. And now you have 15 books. So I, I'm guessing yes. that's gotta be a pretty substantial residual income from that, right? Because now at this point, out of oh. 15 books, people are just continually buying them every week. How many books a day do you usually sell? It's like 6,500 books this month. Wow. Congratulations. That's incredible. So now, oh, thanks, now yeah. you're just doing this full time. 
Yeah, yeah. I've been doing this full time since, I mean, when I, I saw at the end of March, you know, back in 2019, that I've made more in a month than I made in an entire year. I'm like, well, it's kind of pointless to just sit here and keep working for this guy. I, I The way it works with, with Amazon is they're on a 60-day delay. So I actually left my job, um, and I didn't get any of that money until two months later. Yes, uh, But I, I mean, it was definitely worth it. I mean, the second book I put, I sold over 6,000 copies in the opening weekend. I mean, it was, it was absolutely insane. Wow. That's amazing, man. And uh, what do you write about? What are these books about? Oh, um, so basically it's pretty much all fantasy. So there, I don't know if you've heard of this, but there's an emerging genre called lit RPG. It, it's literature based on games. It really started in around 2015 here in the U.S. And, you know, it has the advantage of pulling in, you know, all the fantasy nerds and all the gamer nerds at the same time. Um, so, I mean, I'm sure you've heard of Ready Player One. Think kind of like that, but like medieval versions of it. I mean, not just that. There are so many different versions hmm. of this book right now. And there are a lot of authors like getting it and they're trying to get it legitimized and actually recognized. But that's basically the genre that I write in. Wow. Very cool. So what are your questions then? I started investing around March, but I didn't actually open up a Roth IRA account until about a month ago. And, you know, right now is tax day, the last day you can contribute. And I've only got $3,000 in my Roth IRA. I haven't maxed it out. Um, so the question that I have is, should I move some money from my savings account and put it into the Roth IRA? Yes. Why wouldn't you? Yes. Um, saving for a house, but I mean, I'm not buying a house now, so move it to the Roth. The worst case scenario, worst case, you can always take the money out if you need to without a penalty. Always max out the Roth. And then if you need the money later, then you could take it out. If you really need to, you could take out that $3,000, but at least put it in there. So yes, do it hundred percent. Easy one. Okay. Um, great. So my next question, uh, this is actually about buying a house. So I recently moved from New York to Pennsylvania. Um, stuff is much cheaper here. I mean, I was paying $2,500 a month for an apartment in New York. Here I'm paying eight twenty five, dollars and I have some of my utilities covered too. It's hmm. great. Um, so right now I am saving to buy a house. Now my question is, should I wait until the end of the term of my lease? Because I have the option to extend it for a month by month. Should I wait till the end of the term of my lease to start looking, or should I start looking now? Start looking now. How much longer do you have on the lease? I've got 11 months left on the lease. Uh, what I would do is this. Start casually looking now. If you find the right deal, move on it. But if you don't find the right deal, then just keep looking. It's going to take you a while probably to find something that, that is really going to work. So at least now start getting to know the market. I think that's really important. And if you end up finding a great deal... You could always work something out with your, your landlord to move out a little early. Chances are most landlords that I know of are cool with you moving out early as long as you're going to open up the place to show it. Uh, and sometimes, usually what they'll do is they'll, they'll keep you on the hook for the lease until they find a replacement tenant. So if they find a replacement tenant after a month or two, they'll let you go after a month or two. If it's five months, it'll be five months. If it's sooner, it's sooner. So as long as there's not any lapse of rent... And as long as you will pay any out-of-pocket costs, let's say for like if they're paying a realtor commission or something to rent out the place that's that's at your expense, you know, that that's understandable. But besides that, most landlords would be okay with letting you at a lease as long as you are responsible up until the point where someone else takes over. Not all the time, but a lot of times okay. you're okay with that. Okay. Uh, no, see, because I've made a bunch of big mistakes with my money last year, like... The kind of mistakes that you'd really cringe. I mean, I'm cringing about them just thinking like about what? them. But uh, one of the big ones, um, well, um, up until last year, I was driving like the worst cars you can possibly imagine. Like you stop, the engine will shut itself off in the middle of the road, that kind of bad car. So when I started making money, I went and got myself, I, I, it's not a, not a used car, not, sorry, not a new car. I got myself a used car because I'd never buy a new car. But I spent a ton of money um, on an Alfa Romeo Giulia 2017. Uh, it cost me $34,000 for the car. 
And I took it at a 17% interest rate wow. because my credit history was not good enough. Now, the car is all paid off now, but for about six months, I was paying like it was $700 a month for the car. I was paying more than half of that for the interest. Uh, it was absolutely horrible. That's yeah. Ugh. Lesson learned. I mean, that sounds that sounds like a nightmare. Why would you Why would you buy an Alfa Romeo at at that? It's. I mean, I get that they're cool cars, but you could have easily have just gone a like a Toyota Corolla. Yes, I could have gotten oh, a well. Toyota Corolla, but I sort of lost my concept of money for a bit. When you like, when you're making like you know six or seven hundred dollars a week your entire life, and then suddenly. You know, you start pulling in six or seven thousand dollars. It's it's kind of like surreal. I mean, some months I'd I'd pull in like let's see, my highest grossing month I pulled in like over forty two thousand dollars just from Kindle mm -hmm. and from Audible too, which doesn't cost me any money at all. I got like seven thousand dollars that month. So, so I, it's I mean, close I pulled to fifty in like grand, right? Salary. Fifty grand yeah, a month. Close to fifty grand in one month. Yeah, and. I was like, well, I have all this money. I may as well spend it. So It's tough. That's why that's uh, why windfalls like that are so difficult to navigate. It's a lot easier if you go from like, you know, six hundred a week to a thousand a week to fifteen hundred a week to two thousand a week to three to four to five. Then it's easy. Then you kinda get situated with it. But going from six hundred to, you know, ten, twenty or thirty thousand you know, dollars, it's it's a lot, man. I, I get it. Uh, so that's why it, it's so important. Uh, usually what I recommend to anybody, if, if they're ever in a situation like that, just save the money and don't do anything with it for six months. Nothing. Just savings account. So what if there's some opportunity cost in that? Just put it away in a savings account, figure out what to do with it later. But I think a lot of times mentally people need an adjustment to like having that sort of income around. Um, and then over time, it starts to normalize a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I, something I wish I'd have done, but... I guess you live and you learn. Exactly. Um, so, I mean, right now I'm pretty much just working 24-7. I mean, at my old job, I felt like, okay, you know, I'm just an unmotivated slob. I don't like to work, but you know, I'm working for myself now. I'm up at 5.30 every morning. I, I go to sleep pretty early, too, like, mm -hmm. you know, 10 o'clock every night. But from the second I wake up to the second I go to sleep, it's, it's pretty much just all work. Yep. I'm the same way. I do I've the same thing, more. similar hours. <laughs> Well, thanks so much. I really appreciate the call. And thanks so much for sharing your story oh, I mean, with us. Oh, sure. I mean, thank you so much for having me. You got it. So happy to hear. Cool. I'll talk to you later. All right. Thanks. Bye. Bye. So with that said, you guys, thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. As always, make sure to destroy the like button, subscribe button, and notification bell. Also, feel free to add me on Instagram. I post it pretty much daily, so if you want to be a part of it there, feel free to add me there. As on the podcast, link down below in the description. New videos being posted every Sunday at 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. And lastly, if you guys want two free stocks, use the link down below in the description, and Weeble is going to be giving you two free stocks when you deposit $100 on the platform with one of those stocks valued all the way up to $1,000. $400. So if you want your two free stocks, use that link down below. Let us know which two free stocks you get. Thank you so much for watching and until next time.